For those who remember the Cold War or who enjoy TV spy thrillers, the current news cycle might sound familiar, but only to a point. We're going to be reviewing the charges and the connections of 29-year-old Maria Butina, accused of attempting to infiltrate the Republican Party. Announced right after Donald Trump wrapped up his press conference in Helsinki Monday with Vladimir Putin. While Butina was appearing in court Wednesday, the White House seemed to be seriously entertaining a Kremlin request to question former U.S. ambassador to Moscow Michael McFowl as part of its campaign against investor-turned-activist Bill Browder, enough to still question, despite reversals, whether Trump believes Putin or his own government services. Contrast that confusion in Washington with the U.K., where although authorities are downplaying claims of fresh leads in the latest Novichok poisonings, uh, the overall response there has been unequivocal. Thus, the broader question, is it all just part of the old spy game, or do Western democracies face a whole new kind of threat? Today in the France 24 debate, we're wondering if Russia is outmaneuvering the West. And with us from Atlanta, Georgia, he's a former East German sleeper agent, Jack Barsky, whose autobiography, Deep Undercover, My Secret Life and Tangled Allegiances, as a KGB spy in America is out. Thank you for joining us in the France 24 debate. I'm glad to be with you. We're also uh, joined uh, with us on set by Jeffrey Hawkins, former U.S. ambassador to the Central African Republic. Good evening. And uh, France 24, chief international affairs editor Robert Parsons, a one-time Moscow bureau chief. How are you, sir? Good. The uh, France 24 debate on Facebook and Twitter, hashtag F24 debate. Yeah, Russian embassy officials uh, were to meet this Thursday with the jailed Maria Butina, the Siberian-born gun rights activist who denies wrongdoing and denounces what she calls anti-Russian hysteria. Ivana Skatola has the story. This is the woman accused of trying to influence U.S. politics as a spy for Russia. Maria Butina was charged by federal prosecutors on Monday with conspiring against the U.S. government failing to register as a foreign agent and working to establish back-channel lines of communication for the Kremlin. Court documents accuse her of using sex and deception to establish influential connections in order to infiltrate US political organisations and gather intelligence for a senior Russian official. Accusations that Russia says look strange. One gets the impression that somebody has taken a clock and calculated the best time to take the decision to arrest Maria Butina in order to do everything possible to undermine the positive outcome of the summit with the presidents of Russia and the United States. That's how it was all timed. Court papers also say the 29-year-old used her contacts with the National Rifle Association, of which she is a lifetime member, to develop relationships with politicians and that she had contacts for those working for Russia's federal security services. The FBI also observed her dining privately with a Russian diplomat suspected of being an intelligence operative last March. Her lawyer, Robert Driscoll, has denied the claims and says that she's been cooperating with the US government for several months. She was jailed pending trial after appearing in court on Wednesday. The charges against her are not related to the ongoing US inquiry into Russian election meddling. Jack Barsky, what do you make of this case? Uh, I believe that this case is, uh, is a legitimate case of somebody trying to do a little bit of espionage. Um, based on this, what I've been able to determine uh, from what's in the media, uh, she was, I don't believe she was a trained operative. I mean, trained agents don't uh, communicate via email or Twitter. Uh, but, again, based on what I've heard, she was one heck of an amateur. Uh, she clearly uh, outdid me in terms of effectiveness. She got to people, it was amazing, the pictures she took with all kinds of uh, uh, high-level, reasonably highly placed uh, officials in the Republican Party. It's unbelievable. Yeah, because uh, your orders, if I'm correct, uh, back in the day, were to get close to the then national security advisor, Zygmunt Brzezinski, which uh, you were unable to do. Uh, 
Nia, that, that was a bit of a dream. Uh, this uh, this Brzezinski thing was a, a bit overplayed because I mentioned that name once as an example. Uh, I was supposed to get close to uh, politicians, decision makers, or people close to decision makers. Was not in a position to do so in based on my lowly uh, standing in American society. This lady uh, had a, obviously, in this, this respect, they had start. Uh, and, uh, and I, apparently she, she played a role really, really well. I do believe that this is a legitimate uh, espionage case, no matter what the Russians say. They will deny it uh, un, un, until, in, in face of the hardest evidence you can, uh, you can come up with. Yeah, because she, she's, she's uh, in, uh, she's plucked, according to the news reports, now maybe they're embellishing a bit, but she's uh, plucked out of obscurity from Siberia, and, uh, and brought to the U.S. And as you say, fast-tracked into all these meetings. Our own correspondent in, in Washington recalls meeting her just before the U.S. elections in 2016. Well, I, I, I wouldn't uh, that plucked out, uh, take, I wouldn't take that literally. I th obviously, she's a bright person. She came over here to study. You don't know at one point uh, she was most likely uh, 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 approached by FS FSB or... GRU uh, to the secret services, and interestingly enough, uh, the one thing I uh, I found in the media that she had some interaction with the former ambassador Kislyak. Now uh, Kislyak, he got his uh, his first uh, assignment as a diplomat was to be at the, in the Soviet mission to the United Nations. Uh, that Soviet mission to the United Nations was at least was at least half half of the personnel was KGB. So so we got some interesting connections there. And Jack Barsky, your reaction, you heard the, the in that report, the Russian foreign ministry spokesperson saying, questioning the timing of it, that the Justice Department uh, announces uh, this arrest after having uh, followed Butina for months uh, and announces yeah. it just after that uh, summit had concluded between Vladimir Putin and yeah. Donald Trump. I heard that. I have only one answer. What positive outcome? I, I have, <laughs> there was there was a lot of you know nicety exchange in the in the press conference. Positive outcome means you agreed to do something jointly. There was no agreement of any kind that has been pub published. So I believe I believe that to be nonsense. I believe that to be not politically motivated as some other uh, events in. Uh, in the espionage realm have been, in my view, recently, but this one I think is straight, straightforward. Uh, uh, you, you know, you know what happens when uh, uh, when a decision is made to strike, because before you strike, you observe, you want to see who, what's going on, you you want to anticipate, you want to limit damage. When when you make a decision to actually apprehend somebody, you have a good reason for doing so, and. Uh, that reason may well come out, and maybe it doesn't. But uh, I'm I'm really skeptical these days with regard to the mixing of politics, uh, even internationally. That that includes Great Britain and uh, and Germany and so forth. The mixing of politics with intelligence that that is never a good idea because politicians are pulling stuff out of the underworld that really it, it, you never know whether it's true or not. And and the, the that that that. That is like oil and water, but I do believe that this one is a is a legitimate case. Uh, Jeffrey Hawkins, because uh, she was arrested, like literally in the hour that uh, after the conclusion of that press conference, the Justice Department, at least for the day, held off until they'd finished uh, speaking to reporters. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> keep in mind, this has been a week of uh, uh, um, Justice Department action against uh, accused spies. Um, and this is not an isolated case. As we know, uh, just last week on Friday, um, the Mueller investigation brought indictments against 12 GRU agents. Um, and one thing I'd like to, to, to emphasize for, for you and your viewers is um, this is not like shadowy intelligence. He said, she said, we think this is the estimation of, of, of the intelligence community. These are indictments. Um, these are uh, investigations led by the Justice Department, and this is the Justice Department saying, we have enough evidence, we believe, to prove these cases in a court of law. And that's not 
equivocal. That's not, oh, maybe it's the Russians, maybe it's a 400 guy on his bed. These are uh, uh, cases the Justice Department is quite confident that they can take to court and win. And that is a very big deal. I, I'm going to get back to this issue of timing once more, because some people even describe it as the Justice Department <clears throat> picking that particular day as a message, not to the Russians, but to the U.S. president saying, look, the, uh, the, the judicial branch of government is still doing its job. Yeah, and, and uh, we mentioned it earlier, but keep in mind that this latest indictment against Putina is, is, is not the Mueller investigation. This is just the regular old Justice Department uh, bringing this indictment. Now it's the same people in charge and, uh, you know, the Deputy, uh, Deputy Attorney General Rosenstein and ultimately, uh, perhaps, I suppose, uh, if he doesn't, wasn't recused on this as well, uh, the Attorney General. But... Um, they need to, to, to be clear with the American people um, that there is a real and a clear and present danger um, from the Russian intelligence services to our democratic system in the United States. And, and I think it wouldn't be unreasonable to suggest that maybe timing here was uh, important. The British news, ag news agency uh, Press Association this, this Thursday quoting uh, British police as identifying several Russians who they believe were behind the nerve agent attack on former spy Sergei Skripal and his daughter. Those sources say investigators painstakingly poured over closed-circuit television footage. Now, the security minister in the UK, Ben Wallace, is dismissive. He says those claims belong to, quote, the ill-informed and wild speculation uh, folder. Your thoughts when you follow the Skripal <laughs> investigation, Robert Parsons, in comparison with the investigations, plural, that uh, Jeffrey Hawkins has just described? Well, two completely different things, obviously. The, 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 you know, the British approach is, is, is obviously going to be much more... Uh, trying to find the right word for it. It's not subtle, but it's, you know, they, clearly what they're dealing with is, is something completely different. Trying to trace the trails in many respects is going, is going to be more difficult. Uh, whether or not the security minister is right about the CCTV, it's clear that that's one of the trails... The investigation is going to be following uh, where that leak has come from, whether it's substantial or not. Who who knows? But the from from what I've read, uh, uh, and that's all I've been doing. The the investigation does seem to be making progress. It's not the long so the long investigation you're seeing in the United States, where there are thousands of threads, and the investigation is picking one by one and trying to draw them together. Uh, it's a vastly complicated investigation, which has already taken. Uh, over a year, and it's like to take considerable more time as well. But, you know, obviously both, both bring together a, a, a common concern that the, the Russian government is meddling in the political systems of Western democratic governments with the aim of under, undermining Western democracies. Jack Barsky, is this any different from what we saw in the past? Fundamentally not, but what I hinted at uh, before is what, what is different nowadays. We are playing out uh, too much of this stuff in public. And a, a couple of thoughts with regard to what uh, my two predecessors just uh, uh, said. The indictment of the 12 GRU officials to me is as phony as a $3 bill. Simply because uh, Mueller and his folks, uh, or that was, uh, yes, Mueller and his folks knew that this would never ever come to trial. So you really don't even have to prove this. Uh, this makes no sense. This makes absolutely no sense to indict uh, a dozen folks who are outside of the country. And even if you if you were to try in absentia, you most likely would have to uh, uh, disclose uh, sources where you get the information from, because GRU officials don't run around with a badge on, uh, uh, on uh, someplace that says GRU. And if they, if and when they do a hack, they, uh, they are not clearly identified as such. Uh, I remind, uh, uh, there, there's, a, there's a British uh, fellow in, <laughs> in this round here, I remind folks of the, hesitant, the hesitance by the British government to put Kim Philby on trial in the 50s when it was quite clear that he was spying for the Russians because they were afraid that too much nonsense will come out in public. So the, uh, 
the indictment against those 12, to me, uh, had reasons other than secure, uh, uh, securing uh, or increasing security for the United States. Yeah, so the it's, 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 Skripal it's, case... What, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was going to say, what, your, your point uh, about it, it being case, easier to... to to with with everything being more mediatized, it's easier to well to make noises that are distractions, is what you're saying. You're absolutely right, and uh, and there's a lot of uh, political football being played uh, uh, when it comes to that kind of stuff, and it it appears to be fashionable these days to to make uh, the Russians as the only bad boy on, on the planet. In the meantime. Uh, uh, I have some, you know, in uh, connections. Uh, there are unofficial connections to American uh, 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 secret uh, services, such as the FBI. The Chinese are doing just as much spying as the Russians, if not more. It's just not politically uh, advantageous these days to bring that out in the open. So that's why any time a politician make, uh, opens their mouth left or right or wherever, and to talk about espionage, I am extremely, extremely uh, suspicious. Just one brief word, Jeffrey Hawkins. Yeah, well, actually, if I can respond to two of those points. First, on, on the, yeah, everybody does it, the, the whataboutism that we often see in American politics. Um, there's, a, there's a big difference between espionage, which everybody does, we do, um, and active measures. And taking active measures against our democratic systems are in a whole different category and deserve um, a robust response, not only from the intelligence services, but from the government as a, as a whole, and including our political leadership. Uh, as concerns um, th this being a fake like a $3 bill, no, obviously Mueller has no expectation whatsoever that Russia is going to extradite these 12 GRU, GRU agents, um, just as I hope we're not going to be sending Ambassador McFall to, to, to Russia. Um, but what he does need to do, and he did it in a 30-page indictment that is fairly detailed, he does need to le lay out legally the case for the Russian spying. So right, as well, he starts going after actors that he can get his hands on, um, that case has been made already. All right, I want to thank Jack Barsky for joining us for part one. Part two, we're going to be going over uh, the allegations against uh, the former U.S. ambassador to Moscow. Stay with us. You're watching the France 24 debate. Welcome back, or welcome if you're just joining us. It's the France 24 debate, and uh, we're looking at uh, allegations and ambivalence when it comes to spying between Russia and the West, particularly the United States. With us to talk about it, he is a former East German sleeper agent from Atlanta, Georgia, Jack Barsky, whose autobiography is entitled Deep Undercover, My Secret Life and Tangled Allegiances as a KGB Spy in America. Also with us, the former U.S. ambassador the Central African Republic, the American Library here in Paris, Jeffrey Hawkins, thank you for being with us. Yes. And as well, our Chief International Affairs Editor, Robert Parsons. Now, uh, Robert, you were at that Helsinki summit on Monday where Vladimir uh, Putin openly suggested the questioning of uh, the uh, investor turned activist, uh, Bill Browder, who's something of his bête noire since then, the Russian Prosecutor General's Office, listing Americans it wants to question for, quote, illegal activities. They include the former ambassador to Moscow, Michael McFowell. Uh, he tweeted uh, in response, I hope the White House corrects the record and denounces in categorical terms this ridiculous request from Putin. Not doing so creates moral equivalency between a legitimate U.S. indictment of Russian intelligence officers and a crazy, completely fabricated story invented by Putin. Well, Here's what happened when the question was asked at the White House press briefing. The president's going to meet with his team, and uh, we'll let you know when we have an announcement on that. For a second, is that a topic that came up in their conversation? Did uh, President Putin raise this with President Trump? Uh, there was some conversation about it, but there wasn't a commitment made on behalf of the United States, and the president will work with his team, and we'll let you know if there's an announcement on that front. Jeffrey Hawkins, uh, the State Department uh, corrected afterwards. But what's your reaction to that? Well, <clears throat> first of all, I mean, I am uh, keenly aware of the irony of this because, of course, uh, Ambassador McFall, Mike McFall, was, was one of the architects of Obama's reset with Russia at the time, and, and a time when the Obama administration was really looking to improve relations that had gotten pretty bad. Um, 
when he got to Russia, for a number of reasons, a lot of uh, many of the, 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 the dossiers that we are dealing with uh, really prevented that reset from ever, ever, ever happening. Um, but this was somebody that actually wanted good relationships with Russia before he went out to Moscow. Um, the idea that a, a former ambassador, a former representative of the president of the United States and the American people would be somehow handed over to, to agents in, in a foreign country for questioning certainly sends a chill down my spine as a, for, as a former ambassador. But do I'm you put sure. it down to, I don't know, inexperience on the part of Sarah Huckabee Sanders? Or do you think she's serious when she says, well, they're considering the request? Well, I mean... Uh, it, it appears, um, because they discussed it in the press conference, that that, that uh, President Putin and President Trump uh, talked about this um, from from the press report. President Trump said it was a brilliant idea. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Something and, along those lines. And, and from press reports, uh, apparently uh, Putin sort of couched it in terms of, oh, when he made massive contributions to the Clinton, illegal contributions to the Clinton campaign, uh, Browder, uh, and somehow McFall is wrapped well, up in all of this. Of, and, and speaking of him, he, uh, Bill Browder now, now joins us. So the author of Red Notice, founder of Hermitage uh, Capital Management. Thank you for being with us here in the France 24 debate. Uh, your thoughts sure. on the uh, exchange we heard from the White House on uh, Wednesday? Um, it, 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 it's got to be the lowest point in the Trump presidency that I've ever that I can remember. Here you have a um, uh, an evil dictator, a murderous dictator who is um, uh, on you know who's has been proven uh, to have done all sorts of atrocities all over the world, uh, uh, including killing my lawyer Sergei Magnitsky. Um, asking for the people who are who have been involved in one way or another in trying to hold him to account to basically be handed over to the Russian authorities. And um, if, if I were to be handed over, I would be killed in Russia. Um, but but, but what, what's, what's in a certain way more shocking about this is that there's 10 U.S. citizens on this list who are, um, who are other than, than the ambassador who everybody knows, there's a num number of, of nameless people that, that – um, who have been toiling away on behalf of the U.S. government in Congress, in the State Department, in the Department of Homeland Security, fighting Russian organized crime, fighting Putin's um, bad actions. And now the president of the United States is going to hand over uh, uh, people in this, who have been in the service of the United States government for their country um, uh, to, the, to the Russians who they've been trying to stop. So it's the most absurd thing I, I've ever heard. So, Bill Browder, this is a serious show. This isn't the conspiracy hour. So just tell us, what do you think? Why is Donald Trump talking the way he talked on, on Monday about it being a great idea? You know, I'm, uh, it's not the conspiracy hour, so I'm not going to engage in any conspiracy theories. All I can say is, is that, um, on one hand, his administration has been absolutely appropriate and tough on Russia. His, his uh, 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 Mike Pompeo, the... Nikki Haley, the uh, all Jim Mattis, all of the people who work around him have been tough on Russia. They've been supplying weapons to Ukraine. They've been sanctioning Russian oligarchs. They've been um, uh, attacking Russian mercenaries in Syria. It's a, it's a real proper um, policy towards Russia. But then you get this individual, the president of the United States, in a in a in a secret meeting with the president of Russia and coming up with this nonsense. Um, you know, it, it raises every question. This is effectively a litmus test. For Donald Trump, what, what conclusion you know, do you draw? Um, why it, does he why does he act the way he acts, Donald Trump? I can't um, I, I can't interpret his behavior. I don't think anyone can. It's just it's odd. It's it, it's insane. It's, it doesn't make any sense, and it's not in the U.S. national interest. And and so you know he's he's, he's going on and on about uh, making America great again and America first. It's not America first to hand over ten ten loyal servants, uh, patriotic servants uh, up to, of the United States who have been trying to protect the United States from Russia to the Russian gangsters. Doesn't make any sense. Robert Parsons, you were in Helsinki on Monday. What did you make of the, the president's uh, words and his demeanor there? I mean, I completely agree with Bill Browder. It makes absolutely no sense at all. And perhaps there is there's almost no sense in trying to make sense of what Donald Trump says. You know, one thing that uh, I was sure of when I went to Helsinki was that Donald Trump was going to come up with something pretty eccentric, and sure enough, he did. You know, the, given the opportunity uh, to charge President Putin, a perfect opportunity, the, the way it was, the question was posed to him at the press conference to charge President Putin with interference in the U.S. elections, he did exactly the opposite and said, I can, 
although he went back on it later, and said, I can see no reason why President Putin would have wanted to do that. Uh, it was extraordinary. One realized at, at that point, if his real intention had ever been to turn a page with the Russians, that he was undermining that immediately by saying those words. So one has to question, first of all, does he really know what he's doing? Is he aware of the position that he really holds? And does he take it su sufficiently seriously to, in, to be in that position? And if not, I mean, what are these people around him? Why can't they control them? We heard Bill Browder mentioning uh, all those people like Mike Pompeo, Jim Mattis, all heavyweight people who understand perfectly well what the Russian government is doing at the moment. Why can't they control them? Uh, ultimately, uh, you, you heard Bill Browder say U.S. institutions are still doing their job. Mm. Does this upend the world order as we've known it since the well, Second is, World War? Uh, not yet, no. Let me, but the risk will be that Donald Trump will dis so dismantle the, the architecture that's been put into place since the end of the Second World War that when it's all over, when he departs the political stage... It will, be, it will take an immense effort to put it back together again. And, and, and we're not talking here about one isolated summit, one interaction with Putin. I mean, just in the last week or 10 days alone, a disastrous NATO summit, that, that uh, visit to the UK where, where his son interview uh, undercut uh, 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 Prime Minister May's efforts to, to, to seek a soft uh, exit um, fr from the EU. And then comments subsequent to the summit where he was talking about Montenegro responding to a question from, from a Fox News correspondent and, and uh, calling into question Article 5, which is the bedrock of, 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 of the NATO alliance, which serves our interests. And by, by the way, as an aside, the only time Article 5 has ever been uh, invoked was to support us in Afghanistan. Uh, this is, there is a wider context of, of attacking international institutions that, of which the United States was the architect, and then uh, interacting in a way uh, with the Russian president, with others, that suggests uh, uh, complacence at best. Uh, Jack Barsky, uh, the one-on-one -on -one meeting between Donald Trump and Vladimir Putin, some including uh, Jeffrey Hawkins here present, uh, alarmed by the fact that there was nobody else in the room, are, are we being perhaps, are we overreacting? Um, not really. It's, and, and, you know, I don't have too much substantial uh, here to, to act. First of all, I'm, I'm glad that Mr. Browder joined us because I was going to try to make the case that has to do with the Magnitsky, Magnitsky Act and, and why Putin hates the, uh, Mr. Browder so much. Uh, I read his book, Red Notice. It's a phenomenal book. And it, it, if anybody wants to know what this, uh, this system, the Putin system is like, read that book. Um, anyway, uh, the, I, I can only say one word to this whole thing, bizarre. And with regard to what happened between them one-on-one, -on -one, I think it was just a bunch of uh, nonsense because ultimately uh, one lies and the other doesn't, know, doesn't remember what he said yesterday. Uh, so the reality is this, this is the a sep, this is uh, sort of a, 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 a unreal and has nothing to do with reality uh, the, everything that was talked about uh, and 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 the, that press conference almost uh, i mean it was atrocious uh, that's only one word i can say uh, i am worried about I seem to have lost the connection there. Apologies uh, with Atlanta, Georgia. We'll try to reconnect. Uh, let, let's go to Moscow. Andrei Kortinov is uh, Director General of the Russian International Affairs Council. Ultimately, let's not look at the, at the short term, at the news cycle, but in the long run, has this been a good or a bad week for Russia? Well, it's hard to, uh, to tell because I think that uh, initially the perception in Moscow was that, was that we finally got uh, on the right track because uh, some contacts uh, can be unfrozen uh, and some communication lines can be restored and probably some dialogue on regional issues and also on arms control uh, can be activated. Uh, but now, given the reaction in Washington, D.C., uh, it's not clear whether anything uh, will follow and uh, whether indeed uh, this relationship uh, got any better after the meeting in Helsinki. I think that um, Moscow did not expect uh, such a fierce reaction uh, to the first bilateral summit meeting. 
didn't didn't expect uh, such a fierce uh, reaction. Uh, the headlines, uh, there was one in the UK, uh, in the Daily Mirror, uh, which had a picture of Trump with the headline, Putin's poodle. Uh, ultimately, uh, that you're suggesting, Andre, doesn't play in Russia's favor. Well, it doesn't play in the favor of the American political system or the Western political system is that if president who was elected by the American people is portrayed as a poodle, well, you know, that's not good. I could just say one thing, which sort of backs up in a way what Andrei has been saying. Uh, one of the, the main Russian newspapers, Moskovsky Komsomolyets, sort of make a similar sort of point, said, you know, it's clear that Putin outmaneuvered Donald Trump. And that was a cause of concern for many, uh, of pride rather, for, for many Russians. But outmaneuvering Donald Trump doesn't mean outmaneuvering the American political elite. And if you alienate the American political elite, you create problems for yourself in the long term. And that perhaps is the alley that the dead end that the, the Russian political establishment has got itself in at the moment. All right. Lots of reactions on the well, hash. You know, Go ahead, Andre. Uh, you know, I don't think that the goal of Mr. Putin uh, was to outmaneuver Mr. Trump. Uh, Mr. Putin, whatever can be said about uh, him, uh, is not stupid. And he understands that uh, Donald Trump remains uh, his best, if not the only friend that uh, he can count on in Washington, D.C., why, why should Putin try to outmaneuver Donald Trump? I think that it would be more logical to imagine that uh, Mr. Putin would like to help Donald Trump and to offer him something that Donald Trump can sell back at home. Uh, probably Mr. Putin was not generous enough to offer Trump uh, something bigger than he actually did. I think that uh, Putin limited himself uh, to ideas about, uh, for example, exercising certain pressure on Iran, uh, to make sure that uh, the security interests uh, of Israel uh, will be respected. Maybe there were some other minor concessions. The question is whether these concessions were enough for Donald Trump to declare victory. Bill Browder, do you agree with that analysis? Well, I, I would say that, that um, um, putting aside um, uh, what, what, what Putin got from Donald Trump, um, if, if one of Putin's biggest issues is the Magnitsky Act, which is what he seemed to indicate it was by, by bringing me up as this bargaining chip with Trump, um, it's blown up in his face tremendously because by making me into the central figure or one of the central figures coming out of this thing, um, I've been getting emails from all over the world from, from politicians and government officials who were considering the Magnitsky Act who had never sort of thought, well, we, we, we kind of like the idea, but is it really effective? And Vladimir Putin has been my best advocate for showing how effective it is to show how upset he is by this Magnitsky Act. And so um, we will get more Magnitsky Acts for sure because of this summit and because of his conduct in the summit. Whatever, uh, whatever uh, other objectives he had, that one just blew up in his face big time. All right. We've been talking about international relations here, and the consensus is against Donald Trump on this one uh, throughout this discussion. But what if we looked at it through the prism of U.S. domestic politics? There was an online survey of 3,000 people published by Axios and SurveyMonkey. It shows that 40 percent of Americans still back Donald Trump, including 79 percent of Republicans. And you've expressed your, uh, the fact that you're shocked and appalled. He didn't stand up for his own State Department, his own agencies. 40% of Americans are okay with that, Jeffrey Hawkins. And, and you can go further. I, I read some statistics recently that said 40% of Republicans um, believe, uh, only 40% believe we should be in NATO. I mean, uh, Trump has very successfully, at least with his base, called into question some of the fundamental principles. Is it principles Donald Trump who's right and in, in that respect? Uh, I, I think he is certainly able to... Um, take actions on the international stage uh, in a way that doesn't lose him his base. Um, there are many things that President Trump does, uh, and, and, and they're easily ex explicable for political reasons, whether you agree with them or disagree with them, different, different subject. This one but is, the is a complete States changing? mystery. Is the United States changing? Where I, I don't NATO... think there's a, a groundswell of support in the United States for, for 
uh, improve relations with Russia at the expense of our relations with France and Germany and, and, and Canada. No, I, I, I don't think so. I think this is something, this is an agenda that, that uh, my suspicion is this is an agenda um, that is the president's alone or a very small group around him um, that his base is willing to follow. But we're also seeing the American political class, and that includes some Republicans, um, maybe not as many as we might hope, who have been extremely critical. Somebody like McCain, who called uh, the, the performance this week in, in Moscow a disgrace, the most disgraceful he'd ever seen from a U.S. president. Robert Parsons, yeah. here in France, we have seen uh, over the past decade the conservative right, very Atlantist. Remember Nicolas Sarkozy is, when he became president, going on vacation yeah. in New Hampshire? Yeah. Today, um, he is praiseworthy of, of Russia and of, and of Vladimir Putin, and a lot of people on the French right are like that, and some even well, on the French left. It is interesting the, the way the, the, the so French So why is there this is shift? Is it, and well, how, I, I how think far the shift, does the, the shift? You only have to look across at the Atlantic, I think, to understand why, where the shift is coming from. People here are beginning, as elsewhere in the European Union, are beginning to look at the United States and say, is this an ally that we can completely trust? And should we completely trust it? Perhaps we need to put our eggs in some other baskets as well, rather than put them all in the US basket. I was on a visit with uh, Emmanuel Macron, the French president, to St. Petersburg, where he, not very long ago, where he met uh, Vladimir Putin. And many of the, the things he said seemed to suggest exactly that, that France was reconsidering uh, its international alliances. And there were many things in which France could see eye to eye with Russia. Uh, so, you know, I think what's happening in the United States is having a knock-on effect. I wouldn't push that boat out too far at this stage. I think it's early days, and I think, you know, once Donald Trump has gone, if he hasn't completely destroyed the, ar the post-war architecture, there will be many opportunities to row back. Uh, but it's beginning to happen. Bill Browder, uh, do you agree with that, that the old Cold War East versus West uh, construct doesn't exist anymore? All right, we seem to have lost uh, the connection uh, with Bill Brown. I'll put, I'll put the question before we leave to Jack Barsky. Uh, yeah, we, you lost my connection as well for a while. I think I was <laughs> going to say what I'm really worried about. <laughs> I think there's somebody, somebody uh, 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 doing some sabotage. Uh, uh, what I was going to say is I'm worried about uh, Trump, Trump losing, Trump losing uh, uh, some of the... Uh, uh, the level-headed individual, individuals he has surrounded himself with. But uh, I was thinking the same thing uh, when you asked that question. It looks like the lines uh, that were really clearly drawn, very hard drawn during uh, the Cold War, are getting fuzzy. That is not in the best interest of the West. And if you, uh, if you want to summarize who is winning in this, it would be Vladimir Putin. And uh, we are doing internally in the United States, a great job of fighting with one another. And now we're starting to sort of uh, having a lot of disagreements amongst NATO. That is not, and I repeat this, not in the best interest of the West. Jack Barsky, I want to thank you for joining us uh, from Atlanta. I want to thank uh, as well Bill Browder, Andre Kortinov for being with us uh, from Moscow, Jeffrey Hawkins, Robert Parsons. Stay with us. Media Watch is next. And we say hello to uh, Emma James. Hi there. Uh, online, um, we're seeing fault lines developing there as well. Oh, there are f always fault lines on uh, online. Whenever you look on Twitter, there are always uh, there's an equal and an opposite for every comment. Um, and everyone is obsessed with the idea of espionage right now. And it's not all that surprising that a lot of people are comparing Maria Bettina to Mata Hari. Um, some people calling her Maria Hari, others calling her Bettina Hari. Um, but whatever way people like to refer to it, certainly people think this is a woman who has used her feminine wiles um, to really make fools of a lot of people. 
people in Washington. Um, looking elsewhere, this person saying that Butina was using Twitter uh, for top secret communiques to Mother Russia. Twitter, she's totally Matahari 2.0, says this Twitter user. Uh, and it's interesting to see, actually, with all the concerns about security on social media, that they would have used that method of communication. Um, taking a look elsewhere, this is a photograph that's been doing the rounds a lot. People asking, is this Maria Butina in the Oval Office in May 2017? That is, of course, Sergei Lavrov, the Russian foreign minister, visiting Donald Trump. Uh, and there is a woman who looks vaguely like Maria Butina. I can tell you that it has been debunked, this idea, by Snopes and various fact-checking websites, uh, because it, people have said, no, they, we recognize her. She is actually um, a Security Council, National Security Council staffer who just bears a passing resemblance largely because oh, she's so a she's, woman. she's American. She is American. She's okay. a woman with red hair. Uh, and people basically, I think, have been rootling around for any evidence that she has actually been uh, speaking directly to Donald Trump. Because the headlines a decade ago, are, are Robert Parsons had a field day when, when there was the, 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 the sleeper spy scandal with Anna Chapman. Oh, yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, another fiery redhead. Uh, maybe it's something to do with the hair colour. And um, the other thing that's interesting to note is uh, that a lot of people are obviously talking about where do Donald Trump's loyalties lie? Because, of course, he's made so many contradictory statements now on Russia. Um, but some of the sort of less usual suspects have been asking questions along those lines, <laughs> including a host on Russian state television, no less. Uh, Olga Skabiva, who hosts 60 Minutes on Russia One, uh, her comments have been um, actually written up by Julia Davis, who's uh, a very well-known, respected Russian media analyst. Uh, she's got the words here that came out of Olga Skabiva's mouth. When Trump says our relations are bad because of American foolishness and stupidity, he really smells like an agent of the Kremlin. It, it was interesting, Jeffrey Hawkins, because we heard those remarks from uh, from Andrei Kortinov in Moscow saying that, that it's, a, it's, it's unsettling and uh, it's not in Putin's interest to have that. I think Putin wins anyway, whether he is or whether he isn't, whether the relationship with Trump do, does well or whether the relationship with Trump falls apart. As long as he divides the allies, uh, he's, he's moved ahead. All right, so that's just one controversy that's being covered. Here in France, just briefly, Emma, what, what else? What else is setting the, uh, the 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 web alight this Thursday? Well, it's an ongoing round that's been going on for quite some weeks now about Les Bleus, the French victorious World Cup winning football team, and whether or not we should really refer too much to their African origins. Um, the latest to fall foul of this particular hot potato is Trevor Noah of the Daily Show in the U.S., himself South African, um, who commented that it was Africa who had won the World Cup. He earned uh, a reaction from the French ambassador who wrote a lengthy letter explaining that all but two of the 23 members of that squad were born in France, learned football in France. Uh, they are proud of their country, France, he said. And last night, uh, there was actually a reaction from Trevor Noah himself again. Uh, very interesting to take a look. We've got a very quick clip. Uh, I think we can just about fit that in. Take a look. When I'm saying they're African, I'm not saying it as a way to exclude them from their Frenchness, but I'm rather using it to include them in my Africanness. I'm saying, I see you, my French brother of African descent. Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's like somebody saying, oh, so if you play with your naked child, that's a problem, but if with I do it, I'm a pedophile? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, there's a big difference. So there you go. The words, unfortunately, do echo those of far-right extremists. I've seen that conversation has been raging on, on, on social media this, uh, this Thursday. Everyone has an opinion. Many thanks for that, Emma James. We'll talk about it in the world this week. <laughs> I want to thank our panel once again. Thank you for joining us here in the France 24 debate.